Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we've been talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, but for this episode, a topic that was specifically requested, the meaning of the filioque. Filioque is a Latin word that means, and the sun. However, it also has an interesting history behind it in the church, related to what we now call the Nicene Creed. You see, the Nicene Creed contains, near the end, the words, We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Originally, when the Creed was established by the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople, those last three words weren't in it. It merely read, Who proceeds from the Father? So the question is, where did the filioque come from? The term wasn't present in the Creed when it was agreed upon by the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and ever since then has been a point of disagreement between Catholics and the Orthodox Church, even with regard to what actually happened and when there have been disagreements. One common claim is that the filioque was first used in Toledo, Spain in 587 AD without any permission from anyone in church authority. It does seem to be true that the term was used there and without official permission, at that point in time. The point is then made that the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD prohibited adding anything else to the Nicene Creed or producing any new creeds. This is also true. Hundreds of years later, the Roman Catholic Church, centered in the western part of Catholic-dominated lands, began using the filioque while reciting the creed. This was one of a few issues which led to arguments between the western and eastern Catholic Church about how the creed should be said and who really had authority in the church. Ultimately, this led to what's now called the Great Schism, with the Roman Catholics on one side and the Orthodox churches on the other. The issue of the Pope having the authority to judge the value of a portion of the creed in this way was cited by Roman Catholics, and the Bible is certainly clear that St. Peter, the first Pope, received the keys to the kingdom from Jesus and therefore had the authority, which he exercised at the First Council in Jerusalem. However, while there could be a discussion about that, I think a much stronger point is that the orthodox argument itself seems to leave a few things out. First, the council documents in 431 that are referred to to forbid the adding of the filioque don't really refer to the final version of the Nicene Creed that was used at the time. On several occasions, they refer to the creed of the Holy Fathers at Nicaea. Now, this is significant because the version of the Nicene Creed that was produced at Nicaea ended with, we believe in the Holy Ghost, followed by a condemnation of some heretical views. Another council, almost 60 years later in Constantinople, refined the creed and added more to it, so the 431 council document doesn't forbid altering the creed produced at Constantinople. If taken at face value, it seems to forbid something that had already been done by a previous council 50 years before. Given that the Eastern Church never treated it in this way, though, I think it's best not to take this document at face value, and instead to infer that what it means by the Creed of the Holy Fathers at Nicaea is the Creed, the first version of which was compiled by the Holy Fathers of Nicaea. In short, the 431 Council documents are forbidding any new additions to the Creed from any heretical positions or from anyone else after 431 AD. This would still seem to make the filioque contrary to the council's judgment if it really had been first used in 587 AD. However, in reality, this is not the case. While the term wouldn't be adopted in Spain until the late 500s, an early regional council by the name of the Council of Seleucia Ctesiphon did suggest a version of the filioque in the precise position that we have it in Roman Catholicism today. This council took place in 410 AD in Persia, which means that the filioque was not in fact a Western invention, nor was it unheard of as an addition to the creed. It was used by Christians in this early period. Now, this council is not recognized as an official ecumenical council of the church by any means, but the important point was that the term was in use in the East, in the Christian world, in the time before the Council of 431 made its judgment. However, that's all a bit technical and not really all that relevant to what Christians are required to believe. At most, all of that affects what wording is allowed in the creed itself, but doesn't touch on the question that I think is most important. Is it true? Does the Holy Spirit really proceed from the Father and the Son? Do we have any evidence of this? 
But when the paraclete cometh, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceedeth from the Father, shall give testimony of me. John 15.26 In this verse we see that the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, does indeed come from the Father, but is also sent by the Son. However, more importantly, the Holy Spirit also belongs properly to both the Father, for it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father that speaketh in you. Matthew 10.20 And the Son And because you are sons, God hath sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Galatians 4.6 So it seems that it is true that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and also comes from the Son. The usual way it's been described in the Orthodox Church in the past has been that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father through the Son, which isn't really too different, except in terms of how it's worded. Either one could be used to describe the same reality of the Holy Spirit proceeding from both the Son and the Father, without either group believing any kind of heresy. Next time, a new season on heresies, beginning with monarchianism. See you then. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.